One day, two anthropologists arrived in a district in Southeast Asia. And these two anthropologists, they understood the local language and they were there to observe one of the ethnicities, one of the minorities. Now, when they arrived, the ethnicity welcomes them, if though they were strangers, foreigners, they were treated well. When the anthropologists were among the people, there was this group amongst them, which was another ethnicity, which spoke a similar language, but the majority over there, which was, let's call the majority ethnicity A, then you have that, this tiny minority, which is ethnicity B. Ethnicity B lived in luxurious homes. Ethnicity B had the finest things of life. Their children went to university. Uh, they spoke English and French fluently. Some even spoke Japanese. So they had it all. And there were only around 800 people. While ethnicity A, which was my majority, was around 60,000 people. Now, they spoke a similar language. Ethnicity B, which was 800 people, they spoke with more, with higher tones and very more S sounds in their language. So the two anthropologists then asked one of the elders of ethnicity A who ethni those people of ethnicity B were. The elder did not want to respond to it, so he thought around it. Then one day, one of the youngsters, a guy in his 20s, told the two anthropologists, you know, it wasn't that good of you to ask about the people of ethnicity B. In this case, I'm using ethnicity B as identifier. Then the two anthropologists ask why. We're here to research, and we see clearly that the people of that ethnicity, there are only like 800 people, they have to find things of life, while you, the majority, 60,000, are in the working class. Some of you are even poor. So how can this be? Your languages are all, all similar, you live in the same region. And then the youngster explained. During the time that the French came here to occupy this land, we were just one people, one big ethnicity. We were around 30,000 back then. However, there was this poor guy, well at least, he was poor because his family cast him out, he was an outcast, he was a scapegoat. And the French approached this scapegoat. And this scapegoat, this guy, helps the French establishing the rule over here. When, when a when the French established the rule, this guy received a big mansion as a reward by the French. And this guy invited some of the locals to live with him. And the locals that came to him were other people who were scapegoated like he was. Our ancestors back then were not that innocent. They used to treat the lesser of quite, quite harshly. So many of the lesser of ended up in the mention of that guy that helped the French. After a while, the rest of the population turned on those people that lived in the mansion. But then the French had to intervene, so it became one big bloodbath. And 60% of our tribe killed each other. The French were, majority, were there for the majority to prevent us from going off at one another. So the ones that were left blamed the guy in the mansion for what happened. And as a consequence, they decided they are going to alter their language. They began to use more loan words from Chinese, from Chinese language. And that's how, till this day, you have two ethnicities. You have one ethnicity, which is the majority, which are the descendants of the one-third that survived the genocidal massacre, which was really a collective rivalry that escalated. And then you have the, the second ethnicity, those 800 people 
they are descendants of that scapegoat. And the children he begot with many of those women that sought refuge in his mansion. So their own, those guys over there are just one big family, just 800 people. But during the French rule, also afterwards, many of that family suffered miscarriages and many um, accidents. Why? Because the anger of the survivors of that uh, genocide, of the genocide, they blamed that guy in that mansion. So their descendants also carried this hatred. So collective witchcraft was conducted on that tiny ethnicity. However, the guys from that tiny ethnicity, they began to use paranormal aid to get relief from violence. And they also began to use paranormal aid to excel. And this was easy because they were connected to the French. And that's why people from ethnicity B, they have to find things of life to do the business contracts they have for decades with Europe, also with the Japanese. About people of ethnicity A, which is the majority of us, we are either working class or we are poor. And the reason we are poor, relatively speaking, is because of the negative contention that's in this environment. That better way of thinking that our ethnicity developed after that genocide has been carried on from generation on generation. And that pessimistic way of thinking affects us still this way. Anyone from this ethnicity that wants to make it in life will be persecuted by the others. I had a cousin who wanted to do basketball, who wanted to go to Japan. The people of his village knocked him out, broke all his bones, so he couldn't play basketball anymore. He is in a wheelchair till this day. Why did people do that? Because this guy wanted to make it, he wanted to live, but the rest couldn't take it. They accused him of thinking it was something. And people then, uh, they relieved themselves by putting out all their frustrations on that guy. They didn't want to look at their own inferiority complexes. No, they wanted to just blame someone that disturbed their ease. That's why most people from this ethnicity remain poor or in the working class. While at the same time, they blame it all on the tiny ethnicity of false who are really the scape, who are really the victims. Now, okay, this has, this has been a long parable, I know. But if you would arrive there as a tourist, and we just would observe, you would see two groups of people. One is a majority and one is a tiny minority. You see that the tiny minority lives in big houses, they speak English and French fluently, they all speak Japanese, they even have Japanese wives and all of that, so you think, well, those are the elites. And then you see the working class, and you think, well, those people are just, well, they're just working class. You may think that the elites, maybe you may think that they're small, ethnicity that they are the elites but that's not the case they are the victims of that community but because they have paranormal relief it appears as if they're having a great life they have compensation in the form of houses foreign capital and university degrees some even have phds all of that but when you look at it carefully they are haunted by the rage of the community they are haunted they face a lot of issues in daily life that they don't talk about. But to the outside world, it appears as if they are the elites are having a great life. It's, that's a lie. And it's a lie they tell themselves to feel good about themselves also. The majority, that means ethnicity A, they have ease. They have ease because all their heavy energies are transferred onto that tiny, on the tiny minority amongst them, those 800 people. And because their heavy energies are transferred onto the tiny minority, they don't have to face one another. Many of them can't even explain why they can't stand people of the tiny minority. They just can't stand them. And they don't want to look into why they can't stand them because then they need to ask questions about themselves that they don't want to ask. Now, I entitled this video, Why Pagans Remember. In the parable I gave on the were true and there were two anthropologists that came to evaluate the situation and they noticed immediately something was wrong. 
one of the elders who knew what was going on didn't want to explain it because it didn't add up. A young individual who knew history, who, who also saw the violence working out, knew exactly what was going on. He told the two anthropologists what was, what was really happening. Understand the following here. That tiny minority, those 800 people, they were pagan. They were not believers. They were not born again. They didn't follow Christ. They had their Buddha statues, the Buddha statues, others had Shinto images. Others were into some weird new age thing. They were all pagan. But they knew that without their paranormal activities that they could that they do every morning, the rage of the community would fall on them and they would die. They knew it. They knew very well the history of why things were as they were. So in practice, people from that people from that tiny ethnicity of those 800s, they would not allow their sons or daughters to marry, nor get into any sexual relations with people of the com of, of the majority. Why not? Because the people of the majority still carry this bitterness against the tiny minority. And it happened in the past, let's say in the 1960s, 1940s, 1950s, that some of the common people of that community got sexually involved with people of the tiny ethnicity. At the time, they were not 800, they were like uh, 600. And it, it were traps to devour them. That's why they all married foreign wives. So, now you get an idea of what I'm saying here. Pagans remember for their safety. Pagans don't just think, well, the past is the past, forget about it and start anew. Pagans understand that resets are necessary in life from time to time. Pagans do. But pagans also realize that, hold on a minute, you live in the world and not everyone in the world wants to move on. So you need to realize that those people that don't want to move on, they are around. They procreate, they have children, they produce next generations. And those next generations are affected by how they are in the present. So it's naive to think, well, just forget about the past, forget about history, it's, it's all. You only have the here and now, so you need to focus on here and now. You only live once, life's too short for this and that. Listen, I want you to unlearn all that BS that common people tell you. I'm not telling you to become a pagan either, no. But pagans are practical. They remember history. Okay, let me give another parable now. You have John and Jessica, a couple. They, have, they, they are both retired. They're in, they're in, in their late 50s. Their children are already out of the home and they want to purchase a house somewhere in Indonesia. So they arrive at an island near Sumatra. And there, man, there are many houses, beautiful houses. The price is very low. So John told the real estate officer which house he wanted. The real estate officer, who was a pagan, told them, John, I know you and your wife are retiring. You want a, a quiet place for you to spend the rest of your days. But please consider purchasing this house. And John asked him, why do you say that? Uh, we are certain we have the money. We can pay immediately. The real estate also said, it's not about the money. Really consider if you want to put up with the hauntings of this area. Well, according to John, the real estate officer was out of his mind. He said, sir, you're tired. You've been doing a lot. Just give us a contract. We'll sign it. We'll pay. And then the real estate officer said, we don't work like that. You get two weeks of time to think about whether or not you want to purchase this house. John was a bit frustrated, but he agreed. He didn't want to get into an argument with the real estate officer who had to uh, sell the house to him. But he was on point. Because he thought, I'm just here to purchase a house. And that guy begins about hauntings and all of that. Uh, what is he talking about? Then the brother of John, who knew about the area, told his brother, 
John, you want to purchase a house on that, that island, right? Um, yeah, John said. Well, John, the people on this island are very negative minded. They have business against the Indonesian government, they have business against the Indonesian people. They feel, they feel hard done by, by the rest of society. Why do you think there are many beautiful houses there, but nobody buys them? In the past, people bought those houses and the community turned on them. Not with, with, their, with their bodies, not in a physical manner, but energetically, they turned on them. People got sick, they died in those homes. That place is haunted, John. That's why the God's sake also told you, think about purchasing this house. That the real estate officer, he's a warlock himself. So he knows about history. It's then that John understood why the real estate officer began about hauntings. Now it added up to John, because John thought, normally when people purchase a house, they have a mortgage. We have money to, to pay it, it at once. So now John understood why the real estate officer was reluctant in selling them the house, even though he would get the money instantly. Because normally, if you would pay the money instantly, the real estate officers are very happy to sell the house very quickly. And then John understood everything. Now look, as a believer, you walk by faith. You're not defined by the past, okay? However, the past has its outbreak in the present. And you live in the world where people are holding on to the past. So it's important to remember key things of the past. Okay, let me give another parable and then I'm going to close. Let's say you have someone that had a car accident when he was a kid. Okay, he was not wounded, but he witnessed a car accident. It was a very shocking thing. Now that guy is 32. And now he's 32, he has all those headaches. And doesn't know where they're from. And it even got so worse that he had to quit his job. So he and his wife goes to the psychiatrist and the psychiatrist tells him, sir, did you experience something very traumatic while growing up? I mean, before the age of 10. And the guy couldn't remember anything. So the psychiatrist began to ask him questions about his youth and there were gaps in his reports and the guy himself and his wife realized for a minute well, what happened within those gaps. It was when psychiatrists went into his history that he realized that this guy experienced a car accident at a very young age. He witnessed it. He was involved in a car accident. He wasn't wounded himself, but he experienced people. He saw people dying and he saw a lot of blood and all of it. And the awkward psychiatrist found out that this guy had behavior problems in his early teens which disappeared when he graduated high school. But then the psychiatrist understood is that trauma that was not dealt with that's haunting him now. But he has no knowledge of the past. That's why he can't figure out what's going on. That's why he's looking for answers in the wrong places. That's why no matter which therapy he tried or which medicine he took, it, things, wouldn't, things didn't work because the root was not dealt with. So historic knowledge is relevant. Not because you will hang in historic knowledge, but historic knowledge is relevant in dealing with things in the present. So that things of the past won't perpetuate in the future. Pagans remember because pagans realize it's important, it's relevant. History is relevant. If you have a lack of, of, histor of historic insight, you have a lack in insight in who you are. Okay. I still need to give another parable. Let's say now that there is this guy who is selling newspapers on the street in Bangkok because he doesn't have a job, doesn't have a place to stay. But this guy, man, he doesn't know who he is. Because this guy is, the, is part of a noble household. And the noble household is the sense of a royal household that used to rule a part of, of Southeast Asia before the British arrived. After the British arrived, the royal household was demoted to a noble household. 
And in the 1970s, due to some economic crisis, a part of that noble household became home homeless. But some of them found out about their heritage and returned, and they got involved in the family business. But this man in Bangkok doesn't know who he is. His father belonged to that household, and he had a one-night stand with some chick, and he disappeared. But according to the law of Thailand, because, because he, his father is part of that household, he also has a right on the inheritance. He also has a right on the family estate. So that guy in the street selling newspapers, sometimes um, living in dumpster sites, he is a millionaire. He is. He only has to realize who he is. And once he knows who he is, he goes to the, to the court of law saying who he is and he can invoke he can invoke the bank to hand him out checks because he's part of noble household is quite wealthy so being part of the household implies he has privileges but here's the thing that guy is selling newspapers being treated like dirt in the streets living far below his quality because he doesn't know who he is his history has been taken away from him his mother never told him who he really was because his mother didn't want to face herself and she affected him with this but let's say that one day the guy finds out who he is someone told him you're part of a princely household and he told him get out of there i have no time for this bs how can i be part of a princely household when i'm living like this and then, then the individual told them you're part of a princely household your father is this and this and shows him the record and then the guy finds uh, that guy realizes hold on a minute i'm part of a princely household and the same day the guy goes to the bank and he invokes certain regulations which enabled him to get checks he now is using money from the family's capital which he is entitled to and soon afterwards he's driving this expensive car wearing a suit with a sunglasses and the people that see him in the street of Bangkok think hold on a minute isn't was it isn't that the guy that used to sell newspapers all the time sleeping in dumpster sites but now we're seeing driving this Bugatti he wears a suit he wears a sunglass also what happened the people are shocked. Why? Because that guy found out who he was. He found out about his history. But here's the thing. The people did not want to accept who he really was. So afterwards, the people began to target him. They began to spread rumors about him that he was a criminal, that he was a thug, that he was all of that. And that guy was told by the police not to come to Bangkok anymore because he couldn't um, guarantee his safety. Now, that's all something I want to give you in this message. When you agree with Christ, because when you're born again, you become part of Christ's household. That means that you are entitled to the provisions of God's kingdom. When you find out who you really are, a lot of folks don't want to take it. They want you to be that poor beggar. They want you to be that like that guy selling newspapers, being dependent on the goodwill of others. Having to put up with the will of others. That's how many people want you to be. The moment you begin to walk by faith, you begin to walk financially and things manifest for you, oh there. Be ready to face a lot of backlash. But okay. That's what I'm sharing this video. History is relevant and important. If you don't know your history, you don't know who you are, and anyone can mislead you, lie to you, and exploit you. So as a believer, know who you are in Christ. Christ is both your history, your present, and your future. Because he is yesterday, today, the same, forevermore. That being said, be at peace.